Be in the book of James tonight. Being in the book of James in chapter number four. And I just want to say I'm thankful for the opportunity to preach and to open God's word and look at it together. God's word is full of truth and full of the application of everything we need in our life to go forward and to uh, have a successful life. I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful for Pastor Brian giving me this opportunity to preach. And I'm thankful to serve here. Love you guys. This is my church. Josh asked me when he walked in, um, and he's like, is this your church? Are you from here? I'm like, yeah, born and raised. This is my church. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here and be in this church. And so we're, we're starting in the book of James. And I'll be honest, James was a, a pastor in the city of Jerusalem, and he didn't mince his words. He, he spoke pretty straight. Um, if you read through the book of James, you'll find where he's uh, very pointed in what he talks about. And he comes at things, uh, he gives a lot of instruction like you might find in Proverbs in the Old Testament. And so there was a lot of application, a lot of main points that we're going to see in the book of James as we study. But I just want, you know, I wanted to preface that he's very pointed the way he talks. And let's begin reading in verse number 1 and we'll go down through verse number 10. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse number 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. And weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, I ask you to bless this message, bless the text to our hearts, and speak to us and uh, challenge us, correct us where we need it, Lord. And I pray that you would warm our hearts with the truth of your word. Please help me to speak and not uh, get in the way of the message at all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's many things we want to add to our life, many things that we want to uh, take, uh, directions we want to take our life. I want to accomplish this, achieve this. I want this relationship. I want this job. I want to have this many children. If you're, uh, you're getting your family started like me and Brooke are, uh, we have all these things and plans that we got for our life and how they're going to go. I once had a conversation with a man in this church. He's actually in this room right now. I, was, I think I was in college, maybe just about to go to college, and we were here at a work day. And uh, we were moving and cleaning up stuff, and I had to move like a, a telephone pole, I think, uh, that was in the back. And so I was using my little Ford Ranger, and it was struggling to pull a telephone pole. <laughs> but uh, we were moving it, and when we were done, we were just sitting in the truck, and he, he just looked at me, and with a serious face, he said, you know, you, you've really been blessed. And I, I hear that a lot, and I believe it, for sure. I'm like, yeah, I've been blessed. I've got a great church. I've got a great family. They, they raised me. They love me and pointed me towards the things of God. I, I agreed whole, wholeheartedly. He said, you've really been blessed. You've been given a head start that many people don't get. And, uh, you know, you really have a lot to start with that a lot of people don't have. And I, I, I understood what he was saying, but I definitely couldn't relate to wherever he was coming from. So I just was very respectful. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you noticing that and pointing that out to me. But uh, as I look at it, you know, he's right. You know, the Lord really has blessed my life in a great way, as he has with many of us. And as I sit here now, just several years later, looking at my life and uh, continuing, you know, I'm married now. I've bought a house this year. I have a, a six month old, chunky leg, beautiful little baby girl. And God's really blessed me for sure. But I still find myself at times saying, I want this. I want this. I want this in my life. I want to achieve this. I want to accomplish this for myself. I want, this is going to be so great. I'm going to feel so fulfilled once I have that. And, you know, these things that I desire are not always bad. We're not always talking about some sinful desire that we have. And the Bible talks here, and he, he refers to lust four times in five verses. But uh, when we think of lust, we instantly go to one sin in particular, one gen, uh, genre, one category. You know, the lust only appeals to one thing, but that's not necessarily true. See, lust is desiring anything that we have to step out of God's will. We have to push past God. We have to sin to get there. 
It's desiring something that God does not want for us. And Paul, in James's writing, I might call him Paul a few times tonight because there's, Paul wrote so much of the New Testament, but this is James. He wrote here and he, he talked to uh, the, the, the Jewish Christians that were scattered abroad. He talks to them and he says, from whence come wars? From whence comes struggle and fighting and strife? It comes from your, your lust. And when we desire to have something we shouldn't have. Verse 2, he says, ye lust and have not. You have this desire that needs to be filled, and you go and do whatever you think is going to fill it, but it leaves you empty. Right. You, you don't have your satis- you're not satisfied. You, it never uh, reaches the point where you're like, oh, that, that is exactly what I wanted. It, you just got to have more and more. He says again in verse number two, you kill, literally you murder, and you desire to have and that you cannot obtain. No, no matter what you do, no matter what extreme you go to, it's not satisfying you. You fight in war, yet ye have not, he says again. And he says, because ye ask not. And if you did ask, he says in verse number three, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. The point that James is making as he's addressing these Jewish people, these Jewish believers, I mean, he's writing to, the, Bible, the book actually opens up and says he's writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered. He's writing to a lot of people. He writes and he's talking to them. He's like, look, you guys have these ideas of what you want in your life as if you're in charge, as if you're in control. And I want this, I want that, I want this in my life. And he said, and it's actually leading you away from the Lord. It's leading you to behavior that is not consistent with a Christian, not consistent with what Christ has commanded of us and what he's supposed to be producing in us. And then he goes on and says in verse um, number four, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that French, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. It's direct opposition with God. Friendship with the world. You would say, I'm not a friend of the world. But the truth is, if we ever have something that we desire, say a relationship, a possession of some sort, we have anything that we desire, and we look through it through the lens that the world looks at it. See, the world that looks at a relationship, say uh, a a marriage, they look at it differently than God's Word looks at it. Any, Any job that you have, the world may look at it one way, but God has principles in His Word of how we are to be employers and employees. You know, God has His own way of looking at things. And when you desire something and you look at it through the lens of the world and you operate that way, you are basically aligning yourself with the world against the Lord. You would say, no, I don't, I don't oppose God. I just think you can do things this way. That's how many of us would look at it. But James is writing and he's trying to address and he's like, look, when you desire something and you're pursuing something, you want it and you want it the way that the world has portrayed it to you because the world is very good at advertising and putting things in front of us. We want to keep up with the Joneses or we want to change this about ourselves, whatever it may be. He says, when you pursue it the way that the, Lord, the world has presented it, you are literally putting yourself in opposition against God and against what He has for you. Then verse number 5, this is when everything shifts. It says, Do you think the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But He giveth more, what's that next word? Grace. Grace. He giveth more grace. In the middle of everything that we we would, would identify with these same believers that are going and desiring things that they have no business desiring. They want to accomplish things in their lives that they, they shouldn't. It's outside of God's will. If we associate ourselves with them just for a moment, just think of that one statement, but he giveth more grace. God giveth more grace for, to cover everything in my life that it, it's so much more. God's grace can accomplish more in my life than I could ever attain with it. He could take my life and do something amazing with it if I give it to him. But if I hold on to it and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to have my own pursuits. I have my own ideas about how my life should go and oh, all these decisions. I'm in charge of my life. And if we continue in that way, you know, we're getting off path of where God desires for us to be. And we're missing this important thing called grace. Now, I'm a Christian, but by that, you would all understand what that means. I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ lives inside my heart. He's died for my sin. I've accepted his payment for my sin. I understood that I was a sinner. I needed him, and I trusted him to die, uh, trusted that he did die for my sins, and that that is payment. That is sufficient enough to take me to heaven. I placed my faith and trust in him, and the fact that he would come and die for my sin was an act of grace and alone. Grace is anything that I don't deserve. Anything good, by the way, that I don't deserve. There's some plenty bad that I do deserve, but there's nothing. Anything good that I don't deserve is grace coming from God. Some might call it divine enabling or uh, His divine favor. There's many great things all wrapped up in the package of grace. But grace is for more than just the moment of salvation. 
God's grace is more than just dying on the cross for you. You know, he's got a whole life designed for each and every one of us, all packaged up in this thing called grace that he's extending to us, not because of anything we do to earn his favor. And it's really a good life. It's, it's fantastic. Everything that he's offering to us is really, really good, not because of us, but because of who he is. And that's why he says in that verse, in the middle of all of that negative stuff that they were involved in, but he giveth more grace. He giveth more grace, more grace to cover your mistakes and the things that you're doing that are wrong. The things that we pursue, we give ourselves over to that are actually leaving us empty. The things that we are pursuing that are actually damaging our families. The things that we are pursuing that are actually pulling us away from God and away from the things that we find that we should be pursuing and getting closer to. And then he says there in verse number six, not only but he giveth more grace, wherefore, into the context of grace, that's where we're going to focus tonight, Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. That doesn't seem like a far-fetched idea. That's actually very biblical. We, we've probably heard of that, something along those lines somewhere before. God does not like it when we're proud, and he loves it when we're humble. And so God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Justin, could you come? I'm going to do an illustration, if you don't mind. I need your help, because you're the first person I saw. All right, Justin's going to represent many of us. And I'm going to represent God just for a moment. Justin, you are in the center of God's will right here, right now, right where you're at. But you want to go over there. That's not God's will. All right. This is what many of us will try to do. I want you to walk and I'm going to resist you. Okay. As he keeps on walking, he keeps on work going. Do you think Justin could actually be a little sneaky or overpower? Maybe not overpower, but he could get past me one way or another. Right. <laughs> of course, I'm resisting him the whole time. I am resisting. I, I, I don't want him to go over there. It's not good for him. But, you know, God's not a bully. He doesn't force his will on anybody. He doesn't say, no, you will never go over there. You stay in God's will. He doesn't do that. But we constantly work against him. He's trying to resist. And eventually we'll push past him and say, I don't want to do, I don't care what you say, God. I want what I want. And we pursue our own lusts. We pursue our own desires. And we leave God over here. But, you know, God says, not only do I resist the proud, but get down on one knee for a second. He says, when you, you humble yourself, when you come down, you humble yourself, I'll take you and get back up. And I will enable you. I'm with you. I give grace to the humble. Thank you, Justin. That's what God does. God gives grace when we're humble. That is the bottom line of this message. When we will be humble, when we will humble ourselves, we will turn off the pride. We will resist the pride. When we will set it aside, I want what God wants, not pieces of what God wants for me. I want what God wants. God's grace comes behind us and works with us and takes us to places we never thought we could ever attain. Takes your families and makes them a beautiful image of his goodness and grace and glory. He takes our lives and does something amazing in our workplace. He, do, he takes you to new levels and new heights knowing him personally. God's grace is so amazing. And it's available to each and every one of us. And then that brings us to our first point. As we think about God's grace and the fact that he's got more grace. I love that part. He said more grace, but he giveth more grace, period. Right there, he giveth more grace. God's got plenty of grace to go around for every detail in your life. Whatever's going wrong, whatever is going right, he's got enough grace to just bless you. And it's not just blessings, by the way. Grace extends beyond that. When someone dies, when someone, like this young, young boy, Cade Brandon, he's got... He had seizures. It started with that. And now they find out his blood clots in the deepest part of his brain. God has, God has grace for that. That's not just something a blessing takes. On. God may take something like that and turn it into a blessing, but God gives grace for the darkest moments of our life. And it's all when we humble ourselves and we decide we're going to pursue what he desires for us to. See, look with me, if you would, in verse number seven. And when we desire what God desires for our life, when we desire the grace-driven life, I want what, whatever God's grace has for me. When we desire that, it starts with this. Verse number seven, submit yourselves, therefore, to God, period. It starts with submission. And I like the part that it throw in there, therefore. In light of everything we know about grace, submit yourselves, therefore. Therefore, in light of God and his grace and the fact that he is going to resist us and try, try to stop us and work against us. And look, you don't want to step out of my will. You don't want to leave the place of blessing and God's grace. You don't want to do that. In light of that and the fact that he turns around when we humble ourselves and escorts us and gives us grace and help and everything. In light of that, I have no other response but to submit myself. 
Anything else would be proud of me. I must be humble. We must be humble and submit ourselves to the Lord in agreement to go the direction we have. Now, some of us look at submission as, okay, it's expected of me as a Christian to be in church and pretty faithfully at um, all the services maybe be reading the Bible. I know we're t- I'm talking to the Wednesday night crowd, but we, we have a list of understandings of things that God has commanded of us. And then we say, okay, if I'm submitting, I'm submitted to those things. Submission's bigger than that. Right. Submission is, God, whatever is going on today, whether I knew it was going to happen or not, I need you to lead me. I need your direction. I need your will. I need your blessing. I need you to guide me through this. I am not at the helm of my ship anymore. I am trusting the Lord to lead and direct my life. And that's where we need to get when we think about um, living a grace-driven life, one that is just in the center of God's will, where God just takes and escorts us and does amazing things with us. It starts with submission. It's only logical for us to think of it that way and for, for us to respond to God's grace that he's already extended to us and what he offers to us in grace, it's only logical for us to accept it and go forward. I can never accomplish what God's grace can accomplish in my life. There's nothing I can do. I can never imitate a life that God is blessing and pouring his grace on at the moment. I can never imitate it. I can never get there myself. The only way for me to have that kind of life is to allow the Lord to take my life over. And to lead me. That doesn't sound very appealing, or maybe it does. Maybe it sounds for great preaching, but it's not easy living. I'll I'll be honest. I struggle with this to turn my life over to the Lord and say, whatever you want today, whatever you want this week, whatever you want in this decision that I already have an answer made up, you know, whatever, my mind's already made up, but I'm going to unmake it and let you make my mind up. It's not easy for us to do that. We must learn to be submissive. And then he says also in verse number seven, in a new sentence, he says, resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's a great promise. That's a great promise. Because, you know, when I decide, the moment I decide that I will submit myself to to God, to his word, and to his leading in my life in every area, mind you, when I agree to do that, a red flag goes up and the devil marks me as a target. His goal is not to limit me a little bit. His goal is to shut me down entirely. That's his goal. He wants to ruin your family. He wants to ruin your marriage. He wants to ruin your, uh, where you work. He wants to ruin your, uh, your thought life. He wants to ruin everything he can about you. He doesn't want you to commit to what God has for you. He doesn't. He will oppose you. But the devil, no, the, God's word doesn't say try to avoid him. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say uh, try your best even though he's going to attack you. The Bible says to literally resist him. Someone once told me, they said, I don't think you can preach a sermon without using a football illustration. I'm like, go dogs. So uh, I, I think I can, but I, I don't want to. So I mean, you think about football for a second. The biggest guys in the field, they're not the ones way out in the distant, in the back, you know, watching everything. They're the ones in the middle of the action. The offensive line, the defensive line, they're going at it. The biggest guys, the muscle, all that weight pushing on each other, you know, it's big, it's a, it's a brawl, it's a battle. That's what I envision when I think of resisting the devil, except we're not big like that. <laughs> the devil outmatches us, to be honest. Now, if you think about football, not every play is pushing. Sometimes it's pulling, sometimes it's holding the person still so your other player can get around you. The devil has all kinds of tactics when he's getting a hold of us, when he's resisting us, when he's attacking us, when he's trying to stop us and trip us up from this grace-driven life. When he's trying to ruin it, he's going to come at it from all different angles. Now the truth is, I can't stop the devil from messing up with me, messing me up. I can't. He's, gonna, he's going to attack me. He's going to attack my home. He's going to attack my marriage. He's going to attack my church, my Sunday school class. He's going to attack, and there's nothing I can do to stop it. But the Bible still tells me to resist. And then on top of that, it gives me a promise saying he will flee. Now, I believe he was going to come right back, but he's only going to flee because I've got someone pushing that's a lot bigger than me, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's pushing. He's going to help me fight the devil off. He's going to push him off, and the only reason the devil would ever flee from me is because of the Lord. We need to resist the devil's attacks. We need to submit to the Lord, and all that we do must recognize that we're no match for the devil. And just, just ask yourself, are you opposed to the devil's work and influence in your life? We would all say, yes, I'm opposed. I don't want it. What have we done what actions of opposition have we made to show that we, the devil is not welcome in our homes? What have we done privately where no one else can see anything to say, the devil, you are not welcome in my mind, in my thoughts, in my home, in me. You're not welcome in my behavior. 
You're not welcome to trip me up. You're not welcome to do this. Yeah, I desire the Lord's grace in my life. I desire for him to take me to new heights and to new places. What have we done that is lined up as opposition to the devil? Look with me now, if you would, in verse number 8. This is key. The Bible says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw, to you, draw nigh to you. That's a, another great promise. You know, as I think of this life that God, this grace-driven life where God just takes my life over and leads and does amazing things to me, I figured that would have been the very first step. Yeah. You know, I need to get close to God. I need to do that, but that, that, that's not what the Bible says. I, I believe it's important when God puts things in a certain order. Sure. It's important for that. You see, many of us fall short of this area. I know I do. We, we get this idea of, I'm going to submit to the Lord. I'm going to let Him lead my life. Man, I, I made that decision so many times at camp as a teenager. I, I want God to do what He wants to do in my life. And that's, that, that's a great first decision. It needs to happen. Right. And then we, we fight the devil a little bit, but then what? We get tired. We get tired. We get tore up. We just get, I'm tired of just, I feel like the devil's always winning sometimes. Or even when he does win, I feel, like, I feel beat. I'm so tired of fighting. And this, this stress of trying to do everything the way God wants it done, you know, I'm trying to keep my home clean. I'm trying to keep myself clean. It's just tiring. You're going to get burned out because you're making yourself a mechanical Christian, a list of I've got to do these things because God, I'm submitting to the Lord and this is what he desires for me to do. So you're giving yourself a list of to do's and then you're fighting the devil on the to don'ts and you're trying to do all these to do's and to don'ts and you, you miss the whole beauty of the grace driven life. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It says, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. See, if we are ever going to have this grace-driven life, and it lasts and it sustains itself, we've got to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that starts with salvation. It starts with us understanding that we're sinners and that He needs to save us. But after that, man, we have access to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, some of the very best encounters I've had in my lifetime have not been big and loud with a large crowd. They've been very private. Yes. Some of the sweetest gifts anybody's ever given me, they didn't give me in Christmas time when there was everybody around. It was just me and that person. Right. Some of the best times you'll ever have as a Christian here in this life with the Lord is in your quiet time with Him. Yes. We must have our quiet time. We must draw nigh to the Lord, and He promises He will draw nigh to us. This recharges our batteries. This reestablishes our our dependency on the Lord. You see, the point, I told you back at the beginning in verse number 6, I believe it was, it says that he would resist the proud but give grace unto the humble. Every single point after that has to do with humility. Submitting to the Lord, that's humility. Resisting the devil, that means I'm resisting what I really, what my flesh wants to do. That's humility. I'm, I'm opposing that. And now here we are drawing nigh to God. You don't draw nigh to God with pride. You don't draw to God, God with arrogance or like you're somebody we come into his presence with all humility and worship and all that's how we approach the lord it requires regular humility and we and mind you when we draw nigh to the lord this isn't a once a week thing or occasionally whenever i, I feel like I, I forgot about it i need to get back on it we need to draw be you know, drawing nigh to the lord frequently every day we, it's more than just a devotion time of prayer. It's time in prayer on your way to work. It's time meditating on that Bible verse that you have posted on your refrigerator. It's, it's meditating and talking to the Lord throughout the day. We must draw nigh. I need to be close to you, God. I need you. I need this time with you. Because if, you don't, if I don't have my time with you, God, I'm going to mess up. And the devil is going to come. And he's going to attack. And I'm probably going to give up. And if I don't get close to you, God, I'm going to miss the whole spirit of why you're trying to lead me a certain direction. I'm going to be a little bitter as to why you're, you're holding me to higher standards of Christian living. And I'm missing it. I, I, I need to have that close time with you. You know, I remember as a teenager, I, I, always, I was the kind of kid I like to hang out with kids older than me. My brother, on the other hand, he wanted to hang out with kids younger than him, and they all thought he was cool. But no, I wanted to hang out with kids that were older than me. And I remember, you know, my sisters are two and four years older than me, and I want to hang out with people, you know, the guys their age. And it didn't take me long to realize when you're around them, keep your mouth shut. Because yeah. you're going to say something stupid, and they'll never let you live it down. I wanted to be around those guys. 
I wanted uh, in this church, you know, some of you, it might be some of your kids, you know, I wanted to be around them, you know, I wanted, I thought they were cool. They're two years older than me, three years older than me, four years older. I wanted to be around them. It was so cool. I wanted to be close to them. They didn't want to be around me, really. That's okay, you know, they're older, but, you know, that's, God's not that way. You know, God wants me. God wants to be close to me. He's ready whenever I come to Him. He's not busy. He's like, come on, let's, let's get together. You, you pray, talk to me, unload your heart. Man, I've had some times getting alone with God. They need to be a little more regular. But I've had some sweet times where I just felt like God was giving me a big old bear hug. Amen. I've had times where the Lord just encouraged me and changed my mood. God's done some amazing things in those alone times. We need to have those times where we draw nigh to God and He draws nigh to us. We have to give Him that opportunity. We can't be too busy. We can't be too caught up in what's going on. We need this if we're going to have this life that's grace-driven, if God's going to pour His grace out on us. I don't want to be an enemy of the Lord. I don't want to align myself against Him because I'm too concerned with what's going on in my world. God's got bigger and better things available if I'll just yield to Him and I'll resist the devil and draw nigh to Him. And now look with me, if you would, again in verse number 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is where many Christians like to start when they say they need to get their life right. They want to, and I'm included in that statement. I, we, we think, man, my life is not where it needs to be. I've got sin in my heart. I've got bad things going on in my head. I've got to get it cleaned up now. You know, like the Bible says it, it's not the first thing on the list. It starts with us yielding to the Lord and bracing ourselves for the opposition. But the truth is you're not going to really address the sin the way it needs to be addressed until you have a fresh vision of God. You have some, a fresh time with the Lord. Man, we'll have some great preaching in this church. And we'll be convicted, and we'll get a glimpse, just a glimmer, of who God is and how holy He is and how, what He sees and how He feels about our sin. And we'll get convicted in a moment, and we'll be like, well, let's get it cleaned up. But we need to have some fresh time with God daily. You know, He said, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Unless you're a fourth grade boy, you wash your hands pretty much every day several times. And so uh, he said, clean your hands. It needs to be a frequent thing. We've got to keep short accounts with the Lord. When there's sin in our life, we must keep it addressed to the Lord. We must bring it up to him. It's important to have this fresh view of God and washing our hands frequently. And he calls them sinners. He's talking to Christians. Why? I don't like people calling me a sinner. Call me a saint if you want, but don't call me a sinner. You know, but that's... I told you James was a, quite a, point, a very pointed preacher, but the truth is I am a sinner. I still have sin residing in my heart, and we, each of us do. We have sin, and, and if we try to ignore it or downplay it, it'll, it'll sit and fester, and it'll ruin our life. It'll hurt our life. It'll hurt our homes. We must deal with our sin. It's important that we do that. And then not only do we see that we need to deal with our sin, but he says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, in the Bible, a heart and a mind, they go hand in hand. And they're basically the same thing. He said, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And, you know, that, that phrase, uh, double-minded, those two words, it's only used twice in the Bible. The first time is that actually in chapter 1 of James when he's talking about, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Give to all men liberally, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that asketh in faith, in, uh, I, I'm having a hard time quoting it there in um, Verse number six, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And then it says this statement, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And when we have split affection, if we have split affection in our marriages, we're in big trouble. If we have split affection on the things of the Lord in our homes, our homes are an equal amount of trouble. Right. We have split affection. and We decide that we're, well, at this time of day, this matters to me, but at this time of day, this matters to me, and our affections are all split. When we get to that point, the Bible calls us an, a double-minded man and says we are unstable in all our ways. We are on the verge of disaster when we decide that we're going to try to juggle stuff. Now, yeah. I'm not going to deny we have a lot of responsibilities, a lot of things happening in our life. But, you know, our emphasis and our goal and our, our focus needs to be on the Lord at all times. And he says, uh, he uses that word purify. I, I wondered why. Why not just say cleanse your hands and your hearts? You know, but he said purify. Purify your hearts, you double-minded, he says. And when he says that, he's referring to uh, setting aside. Start setting aside things that don't belong there. 
You know, that, that same Greek word is used as in the apostles uh, uh, in the book of John when uh, the disciples were getting ready for the Passover. They started to purify themselves. They started cutting out certain foods, certain drinks, certain anything, so they could purify themselves for this act of worship. They were setting things aside. We need to be setting aside, setting aside things that are in our own heart, in our own life, in our own mind, our, the things that nobody else sees. Right. We need to start cleaning it up so that we can have a closer, more genuine beautiful relationship with the Lord. Remember, pastor says it all the time, and he's usually referring to something else, but it's still true. Anything with two heads is a monster. Right. You ought not to be double-minded. We ought not to be double-minded. Yes. May we focus on that. And then, as we come to a close, look at me in verse number 9. It says, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. I'll be honest, that verse doesn't fit to me. After all this instruction of what we could do when God is trying to lead us on this grace-driven life, He's trying to give us more grace and lead us down a lifestyle of grace, what is this verse about mourning and crying and weeping doing in the middle of all this? But if you remember the context, He's talking about everything that they were doing with their lust before. If you, if you look back and you think about your lifestyle when you were in charge, when you were calling the shots, when you said, I want this in my life, I want this in my life, when you look back at that, if we're not careful, we'll have a moment where we'll be like, man, those, those were the days. I had fun back then. That was before I got saved. But, you know, yeah. and we'll think of it as some sort of positivity. There's a man in our church. He's, he's a little bit older, and he once told me, I, I, I've heard a little bit about what his, his lifestyle was before, you know, and God saved him, did some amazing stuff. And he said, he once told me in a private conversation, he's like, I don't, I don't miss anything. I don't miss it all. He said, I, I hate it all. I don't like to talk about it. And people that knew me back then, I tell them not to bring it up. I hate it. I detest it. He told me that. And I was like, man, I, I learned something that day. I was like, yeah, that's, that's how our approach should be when we, when we reflect on our sin, when we reflect on our behavior, that is when we are in control and we're pursuing our own lusts. We need to reflect correctly on our past. We, you know, one uh, commentator wrote it this way, let there be a thorough humiliation, and everything that is evil. And let there be a great humility in doing that which is good. Let us humiliate everything that is evil about us. And let us be humble as we seek to do everything that the Lord has for us. And then in verse 10, as we close, he says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. It begins and ends with humility. If you want the Lord to take your life, and do something amazing with it, it begins with humility. We're not going to get there with pride, thinking that we have things in control. We're not going to have victory over the devil with pride. We must be humble. We're not going to have a relationship with the Lord that we need with pride. We must be humble. And we're not going to clean ourselves up with pride, saying, well, this can stay, but this must go. No, we must let the Lord lead our lives. If we desire to have a life that is transformed by the grace of God, if we desire to have that, it starts and ends and continues with humility. May we be humble as we seek the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd help our church and help me, help my family. Lord, I love this place and I love these people. And I know Pastor Brian does as well. And he, his, many of his sermons say, say the exact same thing. There's no place like the center of God's will where His grace is poured out. Dear Father, I pray that You would help us to recognize those times when we are pursuing our own desires with our lives. We, we've decided what we're going to pursue and what we're going to accomplish, and we forget that we're going to come up empty. We forget that we will not have it. And if we even tried to ask You for it, You wouldn't give it to us because it's fulfilling something that's outside of Your will. It's something that you don't desire for us. And if we truly knew all that you had planned for us, and we truly knew everything that you desired for us, we would choose you every time. And I pray, Lord, that you would help our church, help me during this time. Lord, it's easy right now. The message is fresh. Tomorrow is going to be hard. Lord, I want to be submitted to you. I want to be uh, faithful to you. I, I don't want the devil to have victory and trip me up. I want, to, I want to see some great victories in my life in that area. I want to have this, that fellowship and relationship with you that is so sweet by drawing nigh to you and you with me. And dear Father, I also ask you help us with our sin. 
Help us with those parts in our minds and our hearts that are double-minded. The affection is split there. May we have singleness of heart. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us now. As the music plays, Lord, maybe there in your seat you'll be able to take a moment and pray and you'll talk to the Lord as I am now. And church family, may we take some time of reflection and reflect on what God has done in His grace. May we decide that we will be humble and pursue the Lord and let Him have His perfect work in our lives. The Lord gives more grace. It's more than our faults and our failures, and it's more than we could ever make of our lives. Dear Father, Lord, as we continue in this service, Lord, I thank You for Your blessing and Your grace on my life. I ask that you would continue to work in this church. In Jesus' name.